I would like to speak to you about something that is near and dear to you, and the same is true of me. And that is your greatest possession. Oh, you mean my house? My land? My automobile, or plural? Or maybe it's my wife or husband or my children. No, I'm not talking about that because I'm looking at the mind of God revealed in the Word of God, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, and I'm trying to train my mind to see things as He sees it and to value things as He values it. I'm talking about what will exist 100 years from now, 200, 500, or when time is no more and this earthly affair and universe long gone and there's nothing material left. It will still exist and that is your soul. Sometimes soul, being a generic term, refers to other things, but the word spirit as man's spirit is always the inward man that always exists. It's the center of your personality or being. It is you that transcends the fleshly body. So I want to ask the question that comes really from a song, or at least been used in a song. I'm sure it existed long before the songwriter thought about it. But have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? Just let that sink in for a minute. It doesn't make any difference whether you've been a member of the church for years, how much Bible you know, or you're not a member of the Lord's church. Have you, you personally, counted the cost if your soul should be lost? It would be the death of deaths. The word death always means separated. And sin separates from God to die unforgiven is to die separated from God forever. It's the tragedy of tragedies. It's the loss of all losses. Now that's what Jesus discusses in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26. Our Lord there said, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world? And lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? A lot we can glean from that passage. Of course, I'm assuming that all those who will hear this, whether in the present time, this auditorium, or live streams over the internet, or later on as it's recorded, I hope you will realize what a serious matter this is. Unquestionably, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 26, Jesus uses the word S-O-U-L, soul, as referring to that entity about man that is not identified with his fleshly body. That part of us is fathered by God, thus akin to God, and that it's immortal in nature. Notice some of the Bible evidence. I'm assuming people hearing me believe the Bible is the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man. Inspired of the Holy Spirit, men were who wrote it, thus it's infallible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, James 1, 25. That it is the mind of God revealed to us to lead us from earth to heaven as we study, know it, and do our will or His will by submitting our will to Him. So I want you to notice some of the biblical evidence that proves that such is the nature of man. First of all, man is made in the image, the image of God. The Bible's plain and our observation can see it too. Like begats like. Man is made in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Not his physical body, 
but the inward man or spirit or the soul. It bears the imprint of God because God fathered it. God made it. The reason that you have, as we've said many times, a sense of a thing ought to be this way or ought not be that way is because God gave you that in making your spirit. There would be no way that you could see little children tortured and abused and not be really upset because they ought not be treated that way. But you have a spirit made in the likeness of God, and such as that offends you, upsets you. We are the offspring of God, Acts 17 and verse 28. God is spirit. Romans, uh, rather John 4, 29. God is an everlasting spirit, Romans 16, 26. He is a spirit that is not identified with flesh and bones, Luke 24, 39. You know, have you noticed how we have to contrast Him with what we're so familiar with? That is the physical, our five senses, and what we perceive in this life. Therefore, man possesses a spirit, the inward man. I have said many times, the real you, an everlasting spirit, an entity that is not identified with flesh and bones. It's the receptacle of the body and soul. Now again, soul sometimes, because it's a general or generic term, is used to pull both body and soul together. In fact, I would suggest as an interesting study, you just look up the word soul and see how it's used. In a prophecy related to Christ, in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, we find, Because I will not leave my soul in hell. That's the King James rendering. The Greek word is Hades, meaning the place of departed spirits, where we go when we die awaiting the judgment. But there it's talking about Jesus Christ. Because I will not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, the body was back here in the tomb at that time, or had been when he was crucified and died on the cross. He was then put into a tomb, but the spirit wasn't there. Matthew 27, 57 through 60. The soul went to Hades, the unseen world. We know it as paradise where Jesus told the penitent thief he could go and be with him. And where the beggar in Luke 16 was found when he died. So in death, the receptacle for the body and spirit differ. This conclusively shows that man is not wholly body, he's not wholly mortal. He's meant to be together at this time and from further study by Paul's writing... God never intended for the inward man or the spirit of the soul to be independent of the body. Paul call, calls the soul independent of the body in 2 Corinthians 5 as being found naked. Man was meant to wear clothing. And by that I mean of have a physical body. Notice that this text teaches that the body can be killed without the soul experiencing any of that. We also need to note the significance of the word both in the passage that talks about man's body but possesses a body in which his soul, here it's used to signify that immortal nature of man dwells. I try to train my mind to think, now this is just a, a transient place to dwell, fitted for this world for the time I'm here. And when I read my Bible, I find all sorts of folks who love God and kept His commandments, who are anticipating leaving this world. You read the patriarch saying, I'm going to my father's. Or Jesus Himself saying, I'm going to my God and your God. We don't think enough about that, folks. We still look at things ourselves, one another, from the standpoint of here we are, here's the way it works, and here it will be. Yet all around us, it just doesn't stay that way. Jesus is saying that the soul is worth more than anything. Everything in the world. Now, now, why is it such a priceless thing? Why is it valued that way? Well, I've already touched on part of it. It's of divine origin. 
God's the father of our spirits, Hebrews 12, 9. Zechariah tells us, Zechariah 12, 1, it's he that formeth the spirit within man. And I learned from Ecclesiastes 12, verse 7, that at death the spirit returns to God who gave it. Now, if you remember some of these other passages we read regarding the spirit, you know what that means as far as the Hadean world as to where innocent and faithful people go, contrary to where lost folks go, such as the rich man in Luke 16. The soul transcends the earth in all of its powers. Sit down sometime and just think how much your mind is involved with what's going on here. Where do you place your values and your importance and your time and your work? The soul transcends the earth and its powers. The Spirit has the power to communicate with God in worship. That might make a difference even as we have assembled to worship according to God's will on this first day of the week. Because we don't think sometimes maybe as we sing or observe the Lord's Supper or study the Bible, or contribute of our means, and so forth. We don't think of that as communicating with God. What do you think God's doing while His children, and there are a few of them that are really His children on this earth, are worshiping Him? What do you think He's doing? Well, we tend to see as a man when we think that way, or as the way things work. I know in my mind a long time ago, when you used to dial the channels on the television, and some of you might remember that, I know some do. Or if you've got the modern day flip de flip, you just can run through the channels, which is what drives wives crazy. That's incidental, you didn't have to pay for that. It doesn't fit the sermon, but some things do that. I sometimes think of God focusing in on the world and all the people that are worshiping. And each group of people being like a channel, which one will he stop on? And which one will he love and appreciate? And he doesn't want to leave it. Well, if it's not his faithful children as they're defined in the Scriptures, I think he's going to be running through the channels that are blur. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Our mind must be set up on deity as we're engaged in the hymns and the psalms and spiritual songs. In every act of worship, we must be thinking about what that means and directing it to God. So the soul communicates with God as God through His Word communicates with us. The soul was redeemed by the blood of Christ. 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation, that is the manner of life that's pointless or empty, which you received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1.18. All I can say to that is, what a price. What a price that he purchased the church with his own precious blood, Acts 20 and 28. May I suggest that those of you who have become Christians, that you reflect back upon the time when you were baptized into Christ. And when you, in obedience from the heart to that form of doctrine which was delivered to you in the gospel of the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ, that you were baptized into his death, Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4, that it was at that moment that that blood, the efficacious blood of Christ, shed from a sinless body, was applied to your soul to cleanse it from all sins. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. The soul is eternal in duration. I find this in the Psalms, Psalm 22, 26. I wonder how many people know Psalm 23, which is one of the most well-known Psalms in, or any chapter in the Bible, but they haven't looked at Psalm twenty-two, twenty-six, 26, 
Verse 26, your heart shall live forever. Now think about that. God offers eternal life to every accountable person, to everybody on this earth. But it's on His terms. He knows how to save us. Have you ever had your child come up to you, or you remember a time when you were a child coming to your parents, and either mother or daddy's addressed, and the little child says, Would you fix this for me, Mama? Would you help me with this, Daddy? God's our Heavenly Father. He hasn't even waited for us to say, Would you help me save my soul, Daddy, so to speak? We only learned of Christ through somebody knowing the Bible and teaching it to us. We learn how to be saved because somebody learned it and taught it to us. And then we've studied ourselves. But we're sort of like the Ethiopian eunuch when we're reading it sometimes. Uh, do you understand what you read? And we have to say, how can I except some man should guide me? Though dead for centuries... Moses appeared very much alive with Christ of what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, 1 through 9. There is everlasting punishment or life eternal. And that's where we're all headed, to one of those places. Matthew 25, 46. And again, I remind you, as I have already Though they had died, the rich man and Lazarus were very much alive in the other world. Luke 16, 19 through 31. I, can't, I don't have to be able to grasp what's that like to accept the fact from God's infallible word that it's a reality. So, yes, your soul, my soul is your most and my most precious possession. The soul of man defies comparison and surpass, surpasses all things of value. So you can sell, you have that power, you're a free moral agent, you have the power of will. You can sell, you can barter off, or you can exchange your soul for something else. You can exchange your soul for wealth and prosperity. As did the rich young ruler of Matthew 19, 16 through 26. Or as did the rich farmer committed to doing the same thing that was wrong. Made the same mistake, in other words. Luke 12, 16 through 21. Men exchange their souls for wealth whenever they engage in illegitimate business or partake in questionable dealings or put their business before the Lord. There are sins of commission, sins of omission. All sins of transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. And James says in James 4, 17, The him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is sin. So you look at the judgment parables that our Lord gave, and every one of them, He shows people losing their souls because they left undone obligations God intended. You'll not find in one judgment parable that he sent drunkards and immoral people to hell. Now Galatians 5 makes it clear they go there because they live according to the works of the flesh. And Paul says they don't inherit the kingdom of God. But the thing that's so easy to do, brethren, just be honest with yourself, it is in your own life, is to fail to discharge what you know you ought to do. And I again will say it as I've said countless times over my preaching career. We usually measure our faithfulness on the basis of I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do this, I don't do that. And as Brother Woods used to say, well, just add up a column of zeros or what you got at the bottom of it. So much that has to do with people losing their soul is neglect. Neglecting the obligations God's laid down. What's that about, Father? Would you help me do this? Well, he's told us in his word exactly what he did for us. We couldn't do for ourselves. And then he tells us what we need to do to benefit from it. And we go our way. As if we're going to live here, our souls in this body, forever. 
You can exchange your soul for pleasure like Demas. I don't know what Demas didn't like or what he liked. I just know in 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me having love this present world. I think sometimes we may say, well, he must have gone back to being an idolater. He must have denied the whole system of faith. Uh, he must have become a liar and a cheat and a fornicator and whatever else. There's no proof of that. All he had to do was say, following Paul around gets old. He tends to get hit with rocks. He tends to be imprisoned. He tends to be beaten. And he won't compromise the truth at all. He won't bend. And if you're with him, that's what you have to deal with. So I get tired. After all, I'm a member of the church. After all, there are other people in it. And I just am tired. And uh, so, he loved this present world. I think we think loving this present world always means fornication or a robber or something. It doesn't. It just means loving something of this world that in itself is not necessarily right or wrong. But it takes us away of what God expects us to put first. And that, I fear greatly, is going to destroy as many souls or people who are drunkards and adulterers. If we live in pleasure, the Bible says we're dead while we're living. 1 Timothy 5 verse 6. So let us rather be like Moses and never sell our souls for pleasures. Hebrews 11, verse 24. Now, for Mo Moses' day, he, was, he had it all in Egypt. Yet he denied it all and chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. You can exchange your soul for popularity like Pilate. I don't want anybody to think bad of me. There's a multiplicity of people out there. Let's don't live a judgmental life. I, I, all I know is that kind of attitude says, leave everybody in sin alone and let them go to hell. And that's supposed to be a sign of my love for them. Well, I can't find that in the Word of God. Can you? And what am I doing to save my soul when I live that way? I had to judge myself at one point in my life to say, I'm lost in my sins. And if I die that way, I'm going to hell. What am I going to do about it? Father, can you help me fix this? And comes back, coming to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest of your soul. I can see in my mind as clearly now as ever in my memory. The night I obeyed the gospel of Christ, the Cullendale Church of Christ building in Camden. I know within one bench where I was sitting as I made that walk down the aisle to obey the gospel. I remember the young man that was baptized with me. I don't know where he is. I haven't seen him in years. I remember the man that baptized me and one of the elders that was standing there assisting. I like those memories. It was a new life for me and I hadn't been here long myself. I was just 12 and a half years old. But I knew the truth. And I knew even at that stage what needed to be done. The guilt of sin was upon me. And you know, I hadn't murdered a soul. I hadn't committed fornication. I hadn't done any of those things or list of the works of the flesh that I, I can remember. I, I'm pretty sure as a child I figured out some way uh, along those 12 and a half years to lie to mom and daddy because kids do that when they don't even know what lies are. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I got out of some spankings or some kind of discipline that I deserved. But I knew what I needed to do to be safe from my sins because I'd been taught the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I valued my soul. Now, if a 12 and a half year old can do that, I've wondered many times over the years. Well, there's a lot of things 12 and a half year old can't understand and they can't do and I wouldn't trust their decisions at that stage. 
But it does go to show that a person accountable to God who will listen and learn the truth can recognize in his life what needs to be done to save his soul. And if I can do it, guess what? So can everybody else if they want to, if they care to, if they want to see things as they ought to. The chief rulers gave themselves over to the popularity of the people, and they sold their souls, John 12, 42 and 44. As did Pilate. It was because he wanted to be popular with Caesar and with the rulers of the people, and so he had to work it out to where he really could get out of the problem, Mark 15, 15, but it was popularity. And there are young people need to learn this. You don't need to be popular with the people in school if it involves you having to sin. That means you've got to love the truth with all that there is. And you've got to be determined to measure all things in the light of the truth. But that goes right on through life, that principle you just have. But if you're going to be popular, and to be popular you must violate God's will, you don't need to be popular. I've never understood, and I mean this, all my life I've never understood this. Why can't a person just be what God says on his own regardless of what anybody else thinks? And steer your own course as God steers you. And you'll be what you ought to be to yourself, your family, and to everybody else, even your brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, you know, to exchange your soul for whatever it might be is about as foolish as anything could be and that's the case because the world and nothing in it can satisfy people never do learn that where's the truly happy and satisfied rich man oh they may look like they are oh, i wish i had what he had do you where is the very satisfied man of pleasure or ambitious aspirant to whatever this world has to offer when the Bible tells you over and over again in Proverbs, Psalms, nowhere else, that people who live for this world and aspire to the affairs of this world aren't happy people no matter what they appear like. What in this old world will build up a broken heart, alleviate pain when sick, smooth the wrinkles on one's brow and give consolation regarding the future? What can do it? Your car? Your house? Your education? Many have responded to the invitation and said, or indicated in some way that I'm just simply tired of living for the world. Or I'm just sick of the life I'm living. The world doesn't satisfy. I think for Christians, the older you get, the more you just get so tired of the same old thing over and over again as far as the world is concerned. It only gets worse. Seducer seducing and waxing worse and worse. And you just kind of want to go home. There's no kind of to it. You want to. You want to go to the place you've been laboring to get there. The world doesn't last. We act like it does, but it doesn't. But we, we act like it does because we can lie to ourselves and believe it. Heaven and earth shall pass away, Matthew 24, 35. That's just a plain statement, making a claim. The world passes away in the lust thereof. You're going to be hungry and you want to eat in a minute and stuff tastes good or you like some foods better than others. You won't have that someday. You won't have anything that pertains to the appetite of the flesh someday. So why give yourself over to those things at all? The heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Now Peter used that there to say in view of these things that are going to happen, what does that say about how you're going to live? And he wrote that to Christians, folks. You can't take it with you. <laughs> we joke about that. We shouldn't. You won't have that house in heaven, that car. You won't even have your spouse in heaven as your spouse and as you lived it here. But we'll be as the angels. And they don't give or take of marriage in heaven. But we're so anchored to this life. The attorney 
a wealthy man who had just passed away was asked, uh, how much did he leave? And he replied, we left it all. And you've heard that a hundred times. Does it impress us? Does the truth of it hit us right between the ears? Job said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Job 1.21. And then Paul said to Timothy, what Timothy needed to know as a young man and what he needed to preach to the brethren in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 7. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Alexander the Great had his hands placed on the outside of the coffin. And when asked why he desired such an arrangement, arrangement for his body when the time came, he simply said, so they could see a man that conquered the world. But when he left it, he left it empty-handed. That's just true of all of it. And yet, look what we labor for, folks. Look what we spend our time for. All of it's going to be left behind. The man who would gain the world at the expense of his soul certainly is a great loser. But the man who loses his soul does not gain the whole world. Thus, he's a two-time loser. The loss of the soul is the most tragic of all losses. Lesser souls... Lesser losses are, are bad enough. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his health? What profit would it be to be able to buy all the best food, the best automobiles, and uh, the best houses, and all so much land, and then be too sick to eat the food, or to travel in the cars, or to live in the houses? What profit would it be to gain the whole world at the loss of one's physical life? Truly, the loss of one's health or physical life would be terrific losses. But we're talking about a loss that is infinitely worse, the loss of the soul. Now, the loss of the soul means we'll experience two losses. First, one will lose heaven with all of its beauty and joy. Next, one will have been a loser here in this life because he won't get out of this life what God intended. How can we impress it on ourselves that to be blessed in this life and enjoy it is to use it as God intended, and that is to get ready for the judgment. So, if you don't use it right, you will have lost the peace that passes understanding, the incomparable joy of being a faithful child of God in the Christian home, the hope that sustains, the fellowship of Christians, the most beautiful of influences. All that you lose in this life. The loss of the soul is eternal. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, 46. The loss of the soul is an entire loss. The loss of the soul is loss without compensation. The loss of the soul is irreparable. Friendships can be lost and regained. Health can be lost and later restored to some extent. Property can be lost. It can be reclaimed. But you lose your soul. And that's it. It's irreparable. It's irrecallable. And there is nothing that anybody can do, angels or anybody else, no one, your loving spouse, your loving children, your soul's lost. It's just lost. So we begin or end with where we began. Have you counted the cost if your soul should be lost? I don't know of anybody, whether it's one needing to become a Christian or a child of God, weak in the faith or strong in the faith, that doesn't need to be reminded that we're just here for a short time. And what we do here determines our eternal destiny. Now, the Lord has a plan of salvation. If you're outside of Christ, if you're not a Christian, then you're in your sins and you're separated from God. 
Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. But God, through His Son, has a gospel plan because the gospel is God's power to save you from sin. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And that plan is a simple one. You must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and understand what it says. And that understanding leads you to believe that Christ is the Son of God. And you must, John 8, 24. Then you're ready to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. To turn your life around from where it was going in sin to now a life, however long it's going to be in the future, a faithful service to God. To confess your faith in Christ and then to be baptized, immersed in water by the authority of Christ. And to the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins, Acts 2, verse 38. If you do that, the Lord will add you to His church. Acts 2, 41, 42, and 47. And in that church, you can be faithful to Him until your soul reaches home. Yes, our, our Father has helped us. He has offered us the way of salvation. It's simple and plain. Demands our total dedication to Him. But salvation has come down. If you're a child of God and you've wandered, surely if you've thought with me through this, will you look at the places you departed from Him and say, I repent and turn from those and give myself wholly to Him again? We're in the land of beginning again, folks. You can start over. When you lose your soul, that's the end of it. And when this life ends, then we go into eternity and the place in eternity based upon how we live this life. If you need to repent of sins and confess them as God's second law of pardon, Pray God for forgiveness. We invite you to take advantage of this time as we offer the invitation of the Lord while we stand and sing.